For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no man, no one may boast. Amen. It is by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourself. The quick review is going to be kind of a different, take a different turn today. We just heard Ephesians 2, 5 through 9. It's because of his grace that we do what we do. We're taking kind of a different path today. You notice we're not working on the Torah portion. If you didn't read the Torah portion for this week, bad on you. Read it when you get home. Because we're not going to study today's Torah portion. We're actually going to look back at last week's Torah portion and some other things. What Michael just read, in a nutshell, is what our ministry stands on. So when we keep the festivals, when we keep the Torah, we only do so out of love for him. Because it is by grace that we have been saved through faith. Nothing else. We don't follow the Torah teachings to be saved. We follow Torah because we are saved. It's like he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, which commandments would those be? Um, all of them. Obviously, there are some we can't keep because we're not in the land. Some that are meant for the priests only. Some that for us guys, there are some that are meant for ladies that we can't keep. For the ladies, there are some that are meant for the men that you can't, can't keep. So obviously there's some, there's some reasoning that has to take place as we read through the Torah instructions with, okay, what, what can I keep? There's not a temple in place. So Diane read about the, the uh, called the pilgrimage feast. Well, what do we do about those? We can't go to Jerusalem. I mean, maybe we could, but there's still no temple, so we couldn't present the offerings at the temple. All of this we do, we do it because of who we have become. Well, who have we become? We are no longer Gentiles according to Paul, so don't ever say that again. You can't say, well, I, I'm a Gentile follower, I'm a Gentile believer. No, actually you're not. Because the word Gentile means heathen without God. Now, I know my brother Ricky and how much he loves the Lord. If there's anybody that's no longer a heathen without God, he's sitting over in that chair. None of us who have claimed the name of Messiah are any longer heathens without God. So who are we? I wasn't born Jewish. My brother Steve is. But that alone does not give him an automatic pass, if you will, into glory. It is because of Jesus Christ that he is able to do so. Paul talks about how there's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. We are all one who in Messiah. So we have become something different. If we pick up from where Michael left off in Ephesians 2, we are his creation created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we may walk in them. Walk in what? Walk in those good works. Well, what are those good works? Hello. Some people would say, well, hey, Diane, I don't know what those good works are until he reveals us to, reveals us to me. That's, that's a misreading of the text. Paul was a Jewish rabbi. He was a Pharisee. So when he talked about the good works, the good works we read in the Torah, they're called mitzvot. They're called the good works. God prepared beforehand so that we may walk in them. Therefore, remember that formerly, or before now, you, Gentiles in the flesh, or the so-called uncircumcision, you're called that by the circumcision in the flesh, which was made by hands, that you, who, us, Gentiles in the flesh, you were at that time apart from Christ, alienated from the citizenship of Israel. This is a key phrase. Right here, you were alienated from the citizenship of Israel. In other words, you were a foreigner, and you were strangers to the covenants of promise, not having hope and without God in the world. When we were this, when we were Gentiles, before we knew Yeshua Messiah, we were without hope. 
We had no hope at all in this world. None. So what he says is exactly true. Then he goes on and says, but now, in how? Now in Christ Jesus, in Messiah, you, that's us. The ones who were once far away have become near by the blood of Messiah. Consequently, key, therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens. What does that mean? If you're a citizen, what? You're not strangers. You're fellow citizens of the saints. Okay, well, who, who were the saints that Paul was talking about? Israel. Because that's who God chose. It's who God still chose. And I'm going to go here. There are folks that are going to say now, well, especially with everything that's going on now, Y'all are trying to do cultural appropriation because those things of the Torah don't belong to you. Oh, yes, they do. They don't belong to me in the flesh, but they belong to me because of him. They're mine. Steve Schwartz is my brother. In the blood of Messiah, we are brothers. Just as surely as if I was born in the land, we are brothers. We are fellow citizens of the saints and members of the household of God. There's only one household of God. Mm -mm -mm. There are not two. There's not Israel and the church. There's Israel. If you listen to what Stephen said as he was being stoned, he talked about the church in the wilderness. Did you know there was a church in the wilderness? It was. It was Israel who was in the wilderness. Romans 11 says, Now if the first fruit is holy, who was the first fruit? The first fruit would have been Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, those who came before us, those who stood at Mount Sinai. If the first fruit is holy, then so is the whole batch of dough holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. Here's a key phrase. Who are the branches? Now if some of the branches were broken off in you... You, being a wild olive branch, are grafted in instead of them. Is that what it says? It does not say instead of them. It says among them. And became a partaker of the root of the olive tree with its richness. Do not boast against the branches. If you do boast, remember that it's not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. We are grafted in alongside native-born Israel. All of those who have taken Yeshua as their Savior are all part of that tree. And that tree, the root of that tree is Yeshua. The trunk itself, if you will, is Israel. All the branches are all those people who would become part of Israel. Whether at Mount Sinai or today through Yeshua the Messiah. So if we are Israel, if we are now fellow citizens of the people of God, of Israel, like we said before, we do what we do because of who we have become. We have become Israel. We are part of Israel. I'm grafted in alongside my brother Steve just as surely as he's grafted in the tree. I'm in the tree. We're all in the same tree, not two separate trees. We are no longer Gentiles, and what are we? We just talked about that. We have to be Israel. Moving forward, we're today, we are in, remember we talked about the, the seven weeks leading up to the Feast of Trumpets, how the, the prophetic readings no longer fell in line with the Torah portion. Now they're called the, the weeks of comfort. Well, this is where we are this week. I, even I am he, the passage that Jenna read for us, now I'm doing Steve, that Jenna read for us. What was that passage about? God was comforting his people, us. He basically was saying, don't you worry about men. And then he asked the question, who are they anyway? Who do they think they are? And in the passage she read, it ends up with him reminding us, I, he, I am am the Lord God of hosts. I am Yahweh Sabaoth. I am your God. 
do not fear anybody else. That should be a comfort to us, especially in these times. But this is where we are right now. So we only have three more weeks before the beginning of the fall feast, like Carol was talking about earlier. We've seen this before. I know this is a bad graphic. We're going to change gears on this one just in a second. But we're here, basically, roughly. We're at, we're at this point in the middle of August. On the big scale, this is God's call this, it's called the cycle of sanctification. When he's probably in the next couple of weeks or so, we'll teach about this. These are all of God's feasts. It starts off with Shabbat today. It's the first commanded feast. And all of these other ones take place around that. As Carol pointed out, these have already taken place. And they've already been fulfilled in Messiah, which leaves us, if we're here, with these feasts. And this is the season we're about to enter into. With Yom Teruah, what's sometimes referred to as Rosh Hashanah, coming up next. Then Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Shemini Yatzeret are the, are the eighth day. Remember, Sukkot is a seven-day feast with a, with a bonus day. I got here, you got those calendars. Did we get, did Ricky get a calendar? Okay. Because we just want to walk through this right quick and we're going to ask you all a question. This is where, what you were talking about before, babe. So we plan to celebrate, observe Yom Teruah on the evening of September 6th. It takes place evening of September 6th through Tuesday, September 7th. We will observe it here on September the 6th. We will probably observe it, I hope, downstairs in Martin Hall, and we'll have a trumpets, quick trumpets teaching and ceremony, and then we'll sit down. The plan is, I'm going to, going to spring this on her, I don't think she knew this yet. The plan is to have a small oneg, which is a fellowship meal, together downstairs in Martin Hall, and then we'll have a closing prayer. So just kind of mark that on your calendar. Ricky, you can put that out to all your folks, too. Y'all are welcome to be here with us. I mean, it's just going to be a, a, a great time of fellowship, worship. Yeah, we're going to do some, as we do, we're going to do some traditional Jewish prayers. We are going to blow the shofar a bunch of times. And what you need, I'm glad, we, I'm glad you were talking about this. You need to take paper towels in your house. When you run out of paper towels, keep the rollers. Because all of y'all don't have trumpets. Those are going to be your trumpets. If you don't have a shofar at home, just keep your paper towel roller and bring it with you. You can color it or put jingle bobs on it, whatever you want to do to it. That's going to become your shofar so that everybody can participate. Obviously, you won't be playing your shofar the way that Carol sounds that one. But what we will do, envision this for a second. Your little paper towel roller shofar will become your megaphone as we shout to the Lord because of his graciousness. So that's what that's all about. Because that's what this day is all about. And starting the next time we meet, which is the what? The 28th? Is that right? On the 28th, I'll be teaching on the Day of Trumpets. What's it about? Why do we keep it? Why do, why do we keep it? You want to miss that. I don't think you want to miss any of our time together, but that's just me. I'm kind of biased. <laughs> All right, so then that brings us to Yom Kippur. When we teach about Yom Teruah, we're going to also, the week after Yom Teruah, we're going to meet again that Thursday. So the 7, 8, 9, 10th, I think it is, we'll be meeting again. Is that right? Janet, you're looking at the calendar. Is it the 10th? Or is it the 16th? Okay, the 16th? Yom Kippur. No. Before Yom Kippur, the weekend before Yom Kippur. Oh, oh, oh. That's Shabbat before Yom Kippur. Is that the 10th? Yeah. Okay, so on the 10th, we'll be meeting and we'll be teaching about Yom Kippur between trumpets and the Day of Atonement. Because there's something we need to learn about this with regard to what Carol mentioned the 10 days of all. What is that all about? Part of it we're into right now. 
Our plan for this, which is why we wanted to pose a question to you, Yom Kippur is a day of fasting. So those who are able are expected to fast. So this will be a fast day. On the the fifth or the sixteenth is a fast day from the fifteenth through the sixteenth. Our plan is to hold a break the fast gathering that Thursday evening on the 16th. I don't know if we would hold it here in Martin Hall, perhaps, or maybe meet somewhere. So we'd like to get y'all's input. Carol says China won. <laughs> so we'd like to get y'all's input on that. Would you rather get together? We could do potluck, or we could do area restaurant. Right. Or if you'd rather, we can get together on Wednesday evening on the 15th to start the fast. Me personally, we're going to teach on the 10th, we're going to teach about Yom, Yom Kippur. We'll teach about the fast. I think it would be better if we teach about the fast, we enter and go into the fast and gather again on the evening of the 16th to break the fast together. But that's just me. So y'all have time to think about it. Okay, so then after that, of course, is the Feast of Tabernacles. We will also talk about, we'll, we'll teach on the Feast of Tabernacles right the weekend after Yom Kippur. So that would be the 18th, 19th, I think is the Shabbat after Yom Kippur. We'll be teaching on Sukkot. We're going to talk about this a little bit today because it has a lot to do with who we are and what Messiah did for us. But this all takes place during that week. Like she said, we're going to be, we're going to be camping at Purdish Creek that Thursday through the Sunday. If you can make it out there, you're welcome to join us on that, on that Saturday, that Sabbath, because we've got some things planned that I can share part with you right now. We are planning to hold a mikvah ceremony or a baptism ceremony for anybody that's interested that either has been baptized, even if, you ha if you've already been baptized, but you would like to be baptized. Mikvah is the Hebrew word for it. Under a, a messianic approach, you'd be welcome to do so. That's what we plan to do that afternoon on that Shabbat. More to come. Well, we'll send out an email about that. All right, so here we still. Let's, let's, let's kick this thing out with our word of the week. How far behind am I? I think I could do this. All right, our word of the week. Here we go. Ready to write this down? The first one is Baraka. Baraka. And we looked at some of this. Actually, we utilized this word. If you remember, let me back way up for a second. Way up, way up, all the way back out. Back out, back out. Here we go. We used it here, a form of the word. When I said barku, barku is a form of the word baraka. And when y'all said baruch, that's a form of the word baraka. And what exactly does it mean? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's go find out. I need to fast forward on this thing. Here we go. It means empowered to prosper in a nutshell. That's what it means. Now, just chew on that for a second. So when we read... In Deuteronomy, where God has said, I place before you this day blessing and cursing, we get to choose whether we will be empowered to prosper or not. We use the word blessing. Blessing is, our, is the religious word that we use, but we don't, you can, nobody can define it. You can look up Merriam-Webster and his definition of blessing. It, it, it's like real vague. It's just, you know, it, it means like to bless. Okay, well, what's that mean? To bless. If I bless Michael, does that mean he sneezes and I say, God bless you? What, what does that mean? It comes from the root barak, which literally means to kneel. Now, how does, 
How does Neil have anything to do with being empowered to prosper? Once again, this is the depth of Hebrew, okay? This is what we miss when all we do is read the English translations. You kneel as an act of adoration. So when it's from us to God, we do so in the form of adoration. When it's from God to man, now just hang on to your socks for a second. If it means to kneel, and we're talking about how God is going to kneel to man, you with me? You got the same questions I do yet? Yeah. It's like, what? What is what? The king of the universe is going to kneel? Yes, for his children in order to benefit us. It's an indication of the greater one. I don't know if John Hughes is still with us. I think John taught me in one time that this is known as the suzerain covenant, where the greater is kneeling down to the lesser to benefit them. So think about that. The king of the universe, the great God. Who said light be, and light was, kneels down to his creation like you as a father kneel down to your children in order to give them a hug, to embrace them, to scoop them up. That's the king of the universe does that for us. It's to benefit us. Michael? Basically, is that what he did when he emptied himself of the glory? Exactly right. He came down to us in a physical form then. So this is, he's doing this as a precursor to that. He was doing this in Deuteronomy when he talks about laying things before us. And we're going to get to that scripture in just a second. So this is our first word of the week. Bracha, from the word Barak, and forms of that, like we talked about, are Baruch. And Barku, those are forms of that, but it's all around this root to kneel. And that's, this is what I want you to focus on. I want you to get this. I want you to get a picture of this. Remember how we did with the word chesed? I want you, when you're reading your scriptures from now on, and you read the word blessing or bless or to bless, I want you to think about this. I want you to think about the king of the universe kneeling to benefit his creation. I want you to get that picture. I don't ever want you to, to, to be confused about this religious word blessing ever again. I want you to see underneath that so you can so that when you read in the Beatitudes where Yeshua says, <laughs> Blessed are the poor in spirit. He's kneeling. He's empowering to prosper those who are less than. And he's doing so, as Michael pointed out, because he came down to mankind and emptied himself of all of his glory in order to be with his creation. Genesis 12, 2, God is speaking to Abraham. He said, my heart's desire is to make you into a great nation to bless Barak, kneel to you, kneel to benefit you, you, and make your name great so that you may be a blessing, Barakah. Now, if he kneeled down in order to benefit us so that we are, so that we can be a blessing, looks like to me that we're supposed to pass this idea on to other people. In other words, there are no lesser ones. If he kneeled down to benefit me, if Mike needs my help, I should kneel down to benefit him. Paul talked about this when he told us not to consider anybody as greater than we are, but to consider their problems as actually greater than ours. That's Dan's paraphrase, but that's basically what Paul was telling us in that. So this is the first time that this word is used. The, first, the very first time, and it's used in Genesis 12, chapter 2. It's the first time it's used in the Bible anywhere. 
Our other word of the week is kelela, or kelela. It's translated as curse 27 times, cursing five times, and accursed once. Now, this is in primarily in the King James Version, but it would probably be the same in most other English translations, okay? It means to disparage or ridicule. Or more than that, it's from the root kalal, which literally means to cause to make small or trifling. They, we don't, this word's not used much anymore, but when I was coming up and my grandmama wanted to make a comment about somebody, she would use the phrase, I bet Ricky heard it too, she would, them people are so trifling. Well, it, it, was, it was making those people small, okay? All of its nuances grow out of the basic idea of being something being trifling or small or inconsequential. It's translated curse, but it's got nothing to do with directly with the idea of sickness or poverty or any of that kind of stuff. It has everything to do with making somebody small or inconsequential. This is the first time that it's used in Scripture. Once again, it's important to grasp the depth of the Hebrew. Why would it be used here? Then he who, this is Noah, then Noah sent a dove out to see where the waters had receded, kalal, from the surface of the ground. That's the first use of the word. Well, now what happened? What, when we see the word receded, what does that mean? What's, it, what's the water doing in this case? Getting smaller. It's going away. It's no longer an issue to me. Again, y'all just take notes and stay with me because we're getting there, all right? There's something I want you to see. So this idea of, wait a minute, this one, of kalila, translated curse or being accursed or to disparage or ridicule is going to be in a verse we're going to look at. And God is the one that's going to be saying it. And it means to make small to go away from, to recede. Deuteronomy 11, verse 26. You may want to turn there in your Bibles. I don't have a handout for you on this one, but this should not be a foreign verse to you. In the Hebrew, it says, Re'e anochi noten lifrechem hayom baraka u kalala. There's our two words right there. Your translations are going to be see or behold, I, I give or I place or I present before your face or to your face or in front of your face. Go with me for a second. This, this is... This is what that, this is that. Lefnechem. This is that. This is I'm bringing it to you and I'm placing it right, right in front of you. You can't miss it. It's going to be right there in front of your face, okay? We talk about people getting in our face. This is that. This is that idea. Getting in something. You can't, there's no avoiding it. It's right there. This is the way it's set up. I just just showed you that and how it may be different in your scripture, but this is the way the Hebrew reads out. See or behold, I give, set, place, present to, before, or in the face of you, just like I did with Jana. You, you, can't, you can't get away from it. It's right there. Blessing and curse. You might want to circle that in your Bible. I don't know. See, I'm setting before you this day, today, a blessing and the curse. Who's doing the setting? God is. He says, the blessing, if you listen to the commandments of Yahweh your God that I'm commanding you today, today, obviously Moses is speaking, but Moses is speaking, remember, as God's ambassador. The words he's speaking, God has already spoken to him. He's, God has already said, Steve, I want you to go down and say this to Israel. I'm going to give you the words. You're going to speak them, but they're my words. 
So when Moses is saying this, these are God's words. The blessing, if you listen to the commandments of Yahweh your God that I'm commanding to you, and the curse, if you do not listen to the commandments of Yahweh your God, but rather you turn from the way that I'm commanding you today to go after other gods that you have not known. Who's doing the turning here? Who's turning? So there's an action that's got to take place. I'm the one that's got to do the turning. I've got to turn away. He's giving me the warning, don't do that. Because if you turn away, I can only promise you that there's going to be a curse if you do not listen. Listen. Does that look familiar? Don't turn away. That's the translation. Don't turn away, right? Nope. Not for this word. I'm looking at Michael to see if it sounds... What? Shema, which means what? Hear and obey. So it doesn't just mean listen. We've talked about this before. Mama would holler at me. I know she never hollered at y'all, but she would holler. Are you listening to me? Well, she didn't want to know if my ears were working. She wanted to know if I was about to do what she had told me to do. God was saying the same thing. If you listen, Shema, Hear and it's an action word. Hear and do the commandments of Yahweh your God that I'm commanding you this day, or the curse if you don't listen, if you don't shema. Blessing and cursing, he sets the options before us. We saw we have to we have to turn. We're the ones that have to turn. It's our choice. It's not his choice. It's his choice to bless us. But he told us here in his word, I'm placing these, I'm placing this, but here, here it is, right here. It's right in front of your face. You get to choose. It's the same thing he did with Adam and Chava in the garden. He said, all these trees are yours. Eat whatever you want, except that one. That one's mine. Leave that one alone. It was their choice. We Remember, we're not robots. God didn't design us to be robots. I know my Calvinist brothers are going to write me letters and stuff, but we're not robots. He gave us free will. Now, everything that we choose to do is not strange to him. It's not like he sits up on the throne and went, oh, I didn't see that coming. Because he's God. He lives outside of time. So he already knows the choices we're going to make, but it doesn't stop us from being creatures of free will if he, if he knows what choices we're going to make. There's no middle ground you're either on his side or you're not. You can't go, ah, yeah, you know, well, Steve, I don't know, maybe I'll keep part of them. I don't know. I'll... Michael, I'm going to kind of keep. Uh-oh. There's no in-between. So there's not a wheat there. You're either one or the other one. Period. And yet, because of his grace, he continues to let us choose. He lays before us blessing and cursing, and yet because of his grace, not only does he let us choose, but he continues to bless us when we don't deserve anything. That's right. <laughs> I heard a fellow talking about how, what well, the question he had was, if what God said here in Deuteronomy 11, if it's true, and why do we see so many people, now you'll just hang with me for just a second, why do we see so many people in the church system getting so blessed? Uh, because he's God. And he's full of grace. And you can stumble into a blessing all day long. The first person I ever heard teach me that God was not mad at me anymore was also the same person that taught me, this is 40 years ago, that we can walk in the blessings of Abraham. Didn't know anything about keeping Torah, but I understood walking in the blessings of Abraham because God's word is out there. If you stumble along and keep his Torah, the word is out there about how he's going to bless you. If you just keep the Ten Words, the Ten Commandments, okay, there's blessing in those Ten Commandments. 
the first commandment with a blessing is one of the ten. It says, if you honor your father and your mother, then your days will be long upon the land which the Lord your God gives you. That's the first commandment with a blessing. Well, does that mean you must walk in Torah in order to experience God's blessings? No. Now I'm going to get all these Messianic brothers. They're going to write to me. It does not mean that. Because God is gracious. He loves his children. If you're like my brother Tommy Snowden, and I meant to use your name, who, what he understands about keeping Torah is the two commandments that Jesus gave when he was asked, what are the greatest commandments? And he quoted the Torah. He said, the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, strength, and understanding. And the second's like the first, you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. In these two hang all of the commandments. Well, that was a rabbinic statement that was true then as it's true now because those two commandments are considered the two greatest commandments. And you note, neither one of them is written in the Ten Commandments. Well, what Tommy does is he understands those two because he reads where Jesus spoke those two and he does his best to live according to those two. Well, if you try to live according to those two, you're going to stumble all through the Torah in order to get there. Because if you're loving God with all your heart and you're loving your neighbor as you love yourself, how much of the Torah are you going to do? That's going to mean that if I borrow Mike's truck and I borrow it with a quarter of a tank of gas, the Torah principle is when I take it back, it should have a full tank of gas. That's not hard to do. But like my brother Tommy, Tommy would do that because he's exercising love your neighbor as you love yourself, which is a Torah commandment. My point here, though, is, is if you have those folks, we were, I know I was, one of those folks who walked in the blessings of God before I could even spell Torah. If you walk in those kind of blessings then, how much more will you walk in his blessings when you specifically and intentionally keep the Torah commandments? I would say that's where you get into that thing that we read about in Malachi, where God says, the only time he says this, he says, try me in this. And see if I'll not open the windows of heaven and pour out on you a blessing that there's not room for you to contain it. Why? And that's just over tithing. The same is true of all of his commandments. If we've been stumbling through the commandments, the instructions for life, the Torah, keeping a few here and there, here and there, here, we're walking in blessings. How much more blessing will we be walking in when we intentionally walk in the Torah? Which y'all, listen to me, Listen carefully. Listen to me. It is not difficult. It is not bondage. There's more freedom in the Torah than I ever knew in the church system. Because it's very specific. It's very direct. There's no moving targets. You just read what God wants you to do and you go, oh, okay, I can do that. It's, it's really easy. We don't know what we don't know. That's where we are with folks I keep talking about folks in the church system. I Listen, I'm not denigrating the church system at all. If it wasn't for the church system, I wouldn't be standing here talking to you. It'd be Saturday morning, I'd be looking for a cold beer. I mean, I'm just being right up front with you. Because because of the Baptist church and the way that they throw the net, that I even know Jesus. So, God has blessed the church for 2,100 years now. But they don't know what they don't know. That's, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean they don't know what they don't know. But they don't know what they don't know. I mean, they don't even know what they don't know. So how can they walk in those things? And yet God is gracious among those folks who walk in doing all they know how to do. We are responsible for what we know.
we're still talking about the Torah. Carol and I have been doing this, as you know, for <laughs> two decades. <laughs> Does that mean we're old? We're getting older. Older. We're more seasoned. <laughs> but we are responsible now for what we know. Get you, you're not responsible for what I know. You're responsible for what you know. And God's only going to hold you responsible for what you know. But if you refuse to study his word, now you're stepping off out there in an area that he can hold you responsible there. Because he tells us, Paul told Timothy, study to do what, Ricky? Show yourself a proof, right? A workman who's not ashamed of the gospel, who's able to make, a, a Dan's paraphrase, a sound argument for what it is that we believe. We're not supposed to sit in the church and know only John 3.16 for all of our lives. Those are what I call baby Hueys. They just sit in the church and never grow up. But the bottom line is, is that we're responsible for what we know, not for what somebody else knows. Carol and I know of a situation where a, a, an individual that we thought a great deal of has since gone on to glory, but he, he came into understanding the freedom and the beauty of walking in the Torah, of just being Torah observant. It's not walking according to the law. It's not being in bondage to the law. It's just walking according to Torah because we love the Lord to begin with. And he was just excited. And he took a bunch of information and publications that he had, books that he had read and, and commentaries and all these different things having to do with the Torah walk. And he took them to another individual on the East Coast who I guess still has a, a well-known ministry out there. And he took them to give them to this guy. And this other individual went, no, I know what's in there. And if I read that, I'm responsible for it. And he was not willing to look into God's word because he has this huge ministry which would have tripped all that up. Because what's usually taught in the evangelical church, I'm sorry, just the way that it is, is contrary to what God's word said is in the Torah. Because of the different theologies that are out there. So ultimately, again, we are responsible for what we know. But in that case, I submit to you that that individual that would not receive that material was at that moment responsible because he knew what was in that box and refused it. He didn't want to learn something else. See, we can refuse to, to acknowledge and learn something else from God's word, and God will hold us responsible for refusal. Not because it no longer becomes, it's no longer what we don't know. If we know there's something going on with, with that, if, so Gidget's reading the Torah and she knows there's something, she's found something new that could be life impacting and she brings that to me and she starts to tell me what she's learned and I go, no, 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 I, no, I, because of, no, if you, if you teach me about that, I, then I'll, I got to change what I'm doing. God holds me responsible right then. Because obviously I have an idea where she's going with that. And the only reason it would become distasteful to me is because it might change my game plan and keep me from getting more in line with what God is doing. The Pharisees. Ooh. Just like the Pharisees. Did you say that? All right. Enough of that. That's really that was. I know that. I know it was kind of heavy, but we're going someplace. So let's let's do something we all like to do. Let's eat. We'll bring the bacon cheeseburgers and the catfish and the shrimp and the and the, sh and the spare ribs. Doesn't all that look good? Mm -mm 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 -mm. No, it doesn't. We need a great big red circle with a slash through it. What? But Dan, this. Hang on. I'm trying to be gentle, but there's just some stuff we got to talk about, okay? Remember what we said about Deuteronomy? It's a review of everything from Exodus 20 through Leviticus 27-34. It's not a new book. It's not a, it's not a different covenant. I've told you all about the situation back in the 2000s, early 2000s, probably 2004 or 2005. 
uh, when another Messianic rabbi that we know of blessed memory, who put, he just posed the question out there, is Deuteronomy another, is it a second Torah? And oh my goodness, it caused such a stir in the Messianic community. Because people were reading Deuteronomy, it looks like Moses is kind of starting over again. Because he just starts naming off these other commandments and all that sort of thing. Dominic tried to explain, I mean, he opened that bag of worms, and he tried to explain then, no, it's not a second Torah, it's just Moses' commentary on the previous Torah. And there were folks that refused to believe that, because, unfortunately, I'm not going to include, well, I'm going to include you. I'm not going to include y'all because y'all are so new to this. Unfortunately, above the, among the Messianics, we can get pretty stupid because we, for whatever reason, drift toward the sensational instead of drifting toward solid teaching. Thank you, John Hughes, for always keeping me grounded and for not being afraid to go no, <laughs> when I was off, off track. So it's a review. It's the Torah cliff notes, if you will. Deuteronomy. If you want to know what the Torah says and you don't have time to read from Exodus all the way through Leviticus, you just pick up Deuteronomy and read that. It's just the cliff notes. Specifically, Deuteronomy 14, 3 through 21. Michael already knows where I'm going. Here's a chance for me to get in trouble again. It's the second witness to Leviticus the entire chapter 11 in Leviticus. And it says, For you are a holy people. Let's just stop right there for a second. You, you, are a holy people to Yahweh your God, and Yahweh has chosen you to be a peculiar, a peculiar people to himself above all the nations that are upon the earth. You, us, are supposed to be a peculiar people. Some of us are more peculiar than others are, but we're supposed to be peculiar people. Because we're supposed to be peculiar people, you shall not eat any abominable thing. And now he's about to list the things that are abominable. These are the beasts which you can eat, the ox, cow, sheep, goats, heart, deer, roebuck, fallow deer, wild goat, the piriag, which is like a ox, wild ox, the chamois, which is like a deer. In other words, every beef, beast that parts the hoof and chews the cud among the beasts, you can eat. There's the cliff notes of the whole thing. It's real easy. Then he says, these you should not eat because they chew the cud, but they don't divide the hoof. In other words, they, or some of them, may have a cloven hoof, but they don't chew the cud. And he lists all those that are not supposed to eat. And the first one, sorry, I didn't write the book, just reading it. If we indeed are going to try to keep the Torah because we love him, we don't get to pick and choose. Now here's what I will tell you. I know I'm talking about everybody's favorite stuff here. But food was the original sin. God said, don't eat, they ate. And we're still suffering for it. These things here that God says don't eat, did you know that there are a lot of health problems involved in people that do eat these things? Shrimp's just a vacuum cleaner for the bottom of the ocean. Along with lobster, and crab, and I used to be able to eat my weight in King Crab Claws, I'm just telling you right now. So this is not condemnation, it is a decision. So what you're saying, if I eat, if I eat barbecue spare ribs, which I've been known to do, if I eat spare ribs and they give me a heart attack, that's all me. Because he said don't. He said not to eat it, and I ate it, and I suck. Yeah, I get the picture. It doesn't always mean that, and I get, I get Steve, brother. I, <laughs> oh, I'm in trouble. I get it. I, I've been there, done that. I get it. 
Oh, man. Yeah, I get it. But this whole thing is about, yeah, it's about a decision, okay? And it's not, it is not, it is not condemnation. I just want you to see what our Father's expectations are. Yeah, it is a second witness. It's a second witness to do to Leviticus 11. Okay? Why I mess with this? Well, in my case, I'll just give you a little backstory. For me, when I came into the Torah walk, I brought a bunch of baggage. I still carry most of it. Fortunately, she's God's using her to help me toss it out. But all of this was not baggage for me. I really didn't. I, for me, this wasn't a difficult thing. I saw this and went, oh, okay, got it. For other people in the Messianic movement, this was difficult. Doesn't mean impossible, it only means difficult. For me, believe it or not, because I had been in the church system for so long and had been part of leadership in that system, for me, the idea of mowing the lawn on Sunday, I was certain if I fired that mower up, I'm going to get struck by light. And I knew it. I knew, nobody could convince me otherwise. I was not willing to do it because I had been raised from this high that Sunday is the Christian Sabbath. It does not say it anywhere. There's no scriptural reference for that. What that, Mike? But this Sunday after church ham, sure good. But the Sunday after church ham that Mama cooked, and yeah, it was good. I couldn't wait to get home to it. That's right. That's right. Dinner on the grounds. If it didn't include pork, I wasn't going. Ham and cheese sandwiches. That's right. Finger food for the men's breakfast. You better believe it. So anyway, for me, this was not a big deal. But for me, it was Sunday. That was my thing that I had to break out of was the whole idea of Sunday not being Sabbath. Because I taught it, I believed it. So for other folks, there are other things that are not difficult for them, and this may be tough. I bring this up only, only for awareness sake. Because Carol and I believe that it is our responsibility to this small yet growing community. Segway. I'm going to call my brother Mike out and stand in agreement with him because Mike, I believe, by the spirit of prophecy, made a proclamation, I think it was the last time we gathered at the end of the service, that this thing is about to blow up. It's about to outgrow this space. I believe that that's true. And the reason I believe that that's true is because, as you've heard me say, I believe that this is the last move of the Holy Spirit in this time for the end times. Because God's people are no longer peculiar. We go to, and I love them because there's always good food there. We go to dinner on the grounds. God's people are supposed to be peculiar. And yet you go to dinner on the grounds and there's that circular cut ham with the raisin sauce sitting in the front of the table. All the green beans got bacon in them. Where's the peculiar in that? Where is the peculiar in the idea that, okay, you know what, December's coming up. We'll have those little wedding cake balls, the little wedding cookies and, and, the, and the special colored cookies and we'll put that mithra tree, I mean the Christmas tree up in the house and all that kind of stuff. Where's the difference in that? When that day has nothing to do with Yeshua Messiah. Nothing. And yet we call it a religious holiday. And it's getting worse, y'all. <laughs> Carol was listening to Christian music sometime back in July, and they had what they called Christmas in July. They were play y'all, they were playing Christmas music in July. Oh my. Oh man. On Christian station. Yeah, on the Christian station. It's it is it is coming to that point where those things that used to mean something, and they did. 
They no longer mean anything. People can't tell you what, quote, Christmas is supposed to mean. And Christians keep doing that. And now I'm going to, I'm going to pick. Please, please, please stop with the fall festivals. With the trunk or tree. Quit. There's nothing godly about that. You want to take a godly stance about that abomination of a day? Put a, put a Torah scroll out in your front yard or something. Don't even acknowledge it. Because that day, in the, especially in the world today, and even more so, if you... Someday, if you get a chance to get my wife aside, she can tell you some things that would probably stand the hair up on the back of your neck that she is aware of. That day belongs to, at this point, the adversary. And God's people need to start taking it back. But you can't take it back if you don't draw a line. If you're not willing to be peculiar. Set apart. Set apart. And now we need to be even more peculiar because the lines are blurred between God's people and not God's people. Because we're concerned about getting along instead of doing what God says. Sorry, I got off the track. The bottom line here is, is that I just want you to be aware. Doesn't mean like you've got to go home today and take all your bacon and throw it out of the refrigerator. I don't think you'd be hurting anything if you did that, but now you're aware. Taking this step is a big step, and I will tell you this. If you will take this step, your life will change. Things you thought you couldn't do before with regard to the Torah because food has such a hold on people, not on God's people, but on people. Food has such bondage on people. If you'll walk this way and make up your mind to walk this way, your life will change. Your health will improve. Keeping the Torah of God will be a snap because you will have broken the bondage of food. And that's what it is. That's what it can be. So let me move on before I just get in more trouble. Okay, so he goes on. Don't eat these guys. Of course, don't eat. You know, I mean, let's, let's have a big barbecue. Somebody bring a buzzard. We'll put that dude on a grill. <laughs> and some bats and mice. Why do we have a problem with that? But we don't have a problem eating a, a sea garbage collector. Catfish. A catfish. Yeah, which is a bottom feeder. Really? Huh, sorry. It just is what it is. I'm, I didn't write the... Here's my safe part. I didn't write the book. I'm just presenting to you what it says. <laughs> All right. Yeah, here's one. Now, now, wait a minute, Dan. I'm not Jewish. Steve is, but I'm not. So maybe he's got to do that, but I don't have to do that. Yeah, Jewish mind. Too late. Well, I'll be full Jewish. My <laughs> Too late. Was Jewish you, you've was already bad. got the blood of Abraham flowing through your veins. Too all late. Right, you can't, right, you can't weasel out. Jewish, you can't weasel all out. All right, I'll That's be right. Jewish. Doesn't matter. But it doesn't matter. Paul said it doesn't matter. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, male or female, slave or free. Yeah. What's that? My mother, my mother was Baptist and my father was Jewish. So you might say I was brought up to go to the Baptist church on Sunday and the Jewish temple on Friday night. So basically, I had two religions. So what am I really? If you have. If you have recognized Yeshua as the Messiah of the world, yes, you have. are simply a follower of Messiah. Period. So, You're neither. basically, I'm not Jewish or bad. That's exactly right. Because this is not... I'm glad you brought that up. Because this is not religion. I see. This is relationship. I see. It's not about a religion. We, there's a lot of folks try to hang that, that, one, that sign on us. Well, what religion are y'all? Well, we're Messianic believers. Oh, I'm not familiar with that. What denomination is that? Well, it's actually not. We're just trying to follow the Torah. 
You always say what, Michael? I'm a member of the way. A member of the way. I like that too. I like that even better because that's what Paul called us. Yeah. You know, shorty. That's what he called us, the way. Period. That's, see, and that's the thing. So it doesn't matter whether we are native Jews or not. <laughs> and, and again, I fall back to Paul, a favorite of the church. Paul said, it's not the Jews who are Jews of the flesh that are Jews. It's those who are Jews of the heart. It's a hard issue. It's always been a hard issue. Being Israel was always a hard issue. Because those who put the blood on the doorpost on the first Passover, why would they do so if in their heart they didn't believe that God was going to get them out of that situation? It was all about faith then. It's all about faith now. Michael read it for us in Ephesians. It is by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. So we don't do this to be saved. I don't teach this. So y'all can be saved. I teach this because I believe you are saved. And because you love the Lord, you want to do what he wants us to do. It's as simple as that. So whether or not I'm Jewish doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you're Jewish or not. Doesn't matter whether we're Gentile or not. Because we're not. We are part of Israel. That whole circle, the reason behind centering on that is because what we've said before if you oh my if you legally come to this nation and you take an oath of citizenship at the moment that you take that oath of citizenship wherever you came from you are no longer subject to the laws of that land you're now subject to and expected to abide by the laws of this land paul said we are no longer strangers are foreigners to the nation of Israel. But now we are fellow citizens. If we are citizens of Israel, and the Torah is Israel's constitution, then shouldn't we, physical law tells you, shouldn't we walk according to the constitution of the country that we are a citizen of? It's kind of as simple as that. Although, on the surface, it doesn't sound real simple, but it really is. We're just so steep. Right through there. Yep. It's not about our bloodline. It's about his bloodline. All right, the pilgrimage feast. This is why I wanted to get here. I'm, she's got my time. What time is it? Okay, how am I doing? Diane, what time is it? Ten till. Ten till. Whew. I'm going to talk fast. We're going to roll it up to 78. This is the pilgrimage feast, Deuteronomy 16, 13 through 17. We're focusing on the feast of booze for seven days when you've gathered in the produce. It was the last feast day, you saw it in the chart, of God's festivals. Here it is right here. Feast of Tabernacles. A seven-day feast with an eight-day bonus day. Okay? This bonus day was a big deal, and it should still be a big deal, because God sets it aside. He calls it the great day. On this day, there's supposed to be a holy convocation, a holy meeting, which is after the seven-day feast. Why? Well, it's the eighth day. Y'all heard me talk about this. The number eight represents new beginnings. Lay the number eight down on its side. It's the symbol for infinity. It is the time when, is there, these are our three pilgrimage feasts. This is the one we're coming up on. It's the time when Messiah did something specific. The eighth day is called the great day or Shemini Atzeret. This is important because not understanding the feasts keeps us from understanding the apostolic writings more completely. In other words, we read the New Testament. If we don't understand what the feast days mean and the significance of the feast days, when we read the New Testament, we put our own meaning into it. And so we miss the depth of what's actually there. It leads to some faulty theology. Yes, it does. Been there, done that, taught a lot of it. The eighth day closes out the feast and begins a new thing. Here we are in John 7. This is what we wanted to look at. Now on the last day of the feast, 
the great day, the eighth day, Yeshua stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and let him drink. The one who believes in me, just as the scripture says, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. He said this concerning the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were about to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given, because Yeshua Jesus had not been glorified. We all know the account. And we all usually miss the boat on the account. Why was this such a big deal? It was a big deal because of the living water issue. Something called the water oblation that takes place on the eighth day. It's the closing ceremony of Sukkot. And what happens is, I'll try to make this as quick as I can. On that eighth day, as a matter of fact, it's written about in the Talmud. That people who have never seen the eighth day celebration have basically missed the boat because it is such a party. The priests would go down to the pool of Siloam, that may sound familiar to you, and they would gather water at the pool of Siloam, living water, which means that it's moving water, okay? They would gather water, it's called Mayim Hayim. They would take those pitchers of water back up to the temple where the altar was. And they would mix wine with that water. I'm not getting the specifics exactly correct because we don't have time to go into all the details. But basically, they would take a mixture of wine and water. Now, work, stay with me. And they would pour that over the altar. In effect, washing the altar out. Okay, now, if you mix wine with water, what color is it going to be? Yeah. Kind of pink, pinkish. Yeah. Now, if you pour that over the altar, where animals have been burned, where the blood has been splattered on the altar, and you pour that on the altar, what's going to come out the bottom of the altar? What? Blood mixed with water. Where do we see that? On the cross. So right then, when he said that, now here's the big deal. So the explain that. Oh, where they when they pierced his side, scripture says they pierced his side. He's on the cross, and out of his side, out of the hole in his side, flowed blood mixed with water wine mixed with water the same stuff that basically flowed out of the bottom of the altar when they started the new beginning when messiah hung on the cross it was a new beginning y'all for mankind it was a new beginning when the priests would go down and gather this water when they would dip those pitchers into the water at the pool of siloam it'd be like dead silence because it was such a big deal. So the entire Jerusalem is filled with people who have gone to make the pilgrimage feast. They're there for the Feast of Sukkot. They're waiting for the ending ceremony. They follow the priests down there with the, with the, the sheaves and the, and the palm fronds and, and trumpets and shofars and cymbals and drums and yelling and shouting hallelujah. And the priest gets to the pool and the noise stops because he's about to dip out living water, which by the way is mentioned in Ezekiel and Zechariah. The living water that will flow out of people's belly. So it's an Old Testament thing. It's not a New Testament thing. They're already familiar with living water. They've all been mikvah or baptized in living water already, okay? John's baptizing people in the Jordan. That's running water. It's living water. That's, that's, a, that's a thing to the people in that time frame. So they stop and they're silent while the priest is pouring, dipping the water out of the pool of Siloam. Now, as they're taking the water back up the hill to the temple, the party starts again. I mean, they're singing. There's people in front of the priest that are clearing the way and they're laying down palm fronds. They're blowing trumpets. They're blowing the shofars. They're shouting. They're, they're just hollering. They're applauding. And it, that wave carries on up into the temple. As the people in the temple realize what's happening. Now, you've got a temple pool of people that are doing the same thing. All the temple priests now are shouting and blowing shofars and banging drums and hitting cymbals. Until the priests 
gets to the altar with the water and the wine. And now it's silent. Everybody's quiet because they want to see this thing take place. It represents the end of God's feast days. We're about to start a new year. Something new is about to happen. They don't know what's about to happen. So in dead silence, while they're doing the water oblation, while they're pouring that water, nobody's talking except the radical rabbi from Galilee who stands up and shouts across the temple. And you know everybody hears it because they're all quiet at this point. And I, <laughs> I got a feeling he probably used his outside voice. <laughs> you know, his God voice at that point. And he says, come to me and out of your body will, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. What's the implication behind that? It's that life will flow from you into others. Because, yeah, because he's the only one who had life to give. That's what happened at the water libation. The idea was not new. What is this to us? It is to us. Messiah gives us that living water. Why? So that not only will we be with him, because it's going to flow out of our belly. So if I'm down, and my brother Ricky comes over, and he's ministering to me. The words that he speaks to me are life. Because they're not his words. They're flowing up from the Holy Spirit that's in him. That river of living water flows into me and encourages me and gives and it rebirths me, if you will, to get back in the game, to stop sitting on the sidelines. We are supposed to carry that living water with us so that, ready for this? So that when you're at work and somebody's there and they're, they're being the way people can be and you speak to them, once we understand the impact of him being inside of us, the words that you speak will be life to them, not anything else. Without you even knowing it, without you having to think the thing through, the words that you speak will simply be life to a hurting and dying world. Why? Because we're supposed to be a peculiar people, not like everybody else. Takeaways and final thoughts. Is the new life flowing out of your inmost being or is something else flowing out of you? What do the words that you speak sound like to other people? Guilty. When she calls me and she's been mistreated, I think she's been mistreated at work. That's not flowing out of my heart at that particular point in time. I want to get my hands on somebody's neck. I'm just being transparent with you. It's just something I'm working through. So my, in my case, the answer to this question, sometimes it's something else. Because I have to be more aware of his presence in me. We are to be, as Carol said, sanctified, set apart. We're to be different. Doing the same thing the world does does not make us different. That's why we're meeting today. What? Y'all meet on Saturday? Yep. But, yep. That's, and you'd be surprised, just that little bit of different. What kind of conversations that can start? If we still look like the world except for going to church on Sunday. If we still look like the world except for going to church on Sunday, then we're not different. If that's the only thing that separates us from the world, there's no separation. Because church, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Church has become a social club. It's what we do on Sundays. I remember seeing that change starting to take place. That doesn't mean that folks that are going 
to worship tomorrow, that there are not sincere people there. They are. A friend of mine told me that last week, Pastor Mike here had a bunch of Methodists down there saying yes and amen, sounded like Ebenezer Baptist Church. And I'm like, good. Roll them out. That's a great thing to do. But unfortunately, this church is not the norm. The church system is about compromise. It's about being relevant. You want to be relevant to the world? Make sure there's new life flowing out of your belly. That's how you become relevant. They might not like you, but when they're looking for somebody to pray and they come beating your door down, Jenna, that's all that matters. I don't want to be known as a good teacher. I don't care about being known as somebody that's smart or none of that. But I do want to be known as somebody that will pray for you and just crush the devil's head for you. I just want to be that guy. As we approach... Yeah, that's right. As we approach the fall feast, now is the time to examine ourselves. We're in the month of Elul. We've talked about how this month is known as a month of introspection. It's a month of examination. I showed you the thing about food and all that sort of thing. There's no condemnation in that. It's just that this month is a time for examination. Well, if I don't give you something to think about, what are you going to examine? This is the month, as Carol said, when Yom Teruah gets here, when the Day of Trumpets gets here. That's the beginning of a real time of repentance. But before we get there, we examine ourselves. We need to do a gut check. I mean, a real live, no kidding, show enough, get down and dirty, I ain't playing, gut check. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> I know. I do. When I wrote this down, I was like, Lord, really? We got, uh, man. Because we all need it. Do you really want to be sanctified? This is the deal. Because none of this matters. If you don't really want to be sanctified, if you don't want to be set apart for him, if you don't want to be peculiar for the king of the universe, forget about all this and everything we talked about. Because it doesn't matter. If you want to do this, then you need to do this. That's what I want to hear. That's what we want to hear. John 14 and verse 15, this is what we close with. Yeshua is speaking. He said, He said, If you love me, keep my commandments. Shabbat Shalom. Father, our King, our Redeemer, our merciful Lord. We love you, sir. All of us here, I know that I can speak for this congregation. We love you. And we do, as Michael said, Father, we do want to hear in that final day, well done, good and faithful servant. We know that times are coming that that may be a difficult choice for us just thinking realistically and so we ask you to strengthen us and encourage us so that no matter the choice we will always choose you whether that's about religious tradition somebody else's theology or just being seen as weird because we actually believe that your word is true. Help us to always choose you no matter what. Father, we bless you and we magnify you because you alone are worthy of our praise. We just ask that the words that have been spoken today will fall on fertile ground, mine included, that our lives will be changed that we will be prepared for the fall feasts as they come up. So we place these petitions before you in that name that is above every name, in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, and everyone said, Amen. 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 And Jan, it looks like we're going to have to ask that question off ma offline, I guess. Because it's a great question. And, and one of the things that I've been thinking about is,
while you're getting ready for yeah. to bless everybody with Aaron and blessing, I just want to back up to that trunk or tree situation you talked about. Yeah. That that day of that's called Halloween. Yeah. Really, you know, what's more fun is to do what God commanded us. The Feast of Tabernacles could be like you could do that at your church, right? Or in, in your community, the fall the fall festivals, the Feast of Tabernacles is seven days. So instead of just doing that one evil day called Halloween in October, right? Mm -hmm. You could just do the whole week and tell children about God's Word. Yep. That's a great teaching opportunity. Yep. It's like yeah, teaching them about evil and keeping that going, which is the devil would love. Teach about God's stuff. It's a party for seven days. You cannot beat that. Kids well, I'm real simple anyway, you know. So when I was making that decision, it was like, okay. I can either keep God's feast, and there's seven of those, with, including a seven-day feast, mm -hmm. or I can keep these two feasts that I'm not real sure about. <laughs> you don't have much depth to them. Right? I'm pretty there's, simple. There, then seven no or them. two. Uh, I'm going with seven, yeah. And there's only one. So if you all stand, we'll impart the blessing. Yivaraka ka Yahweh v'yishmareka, Ye'er Yahweh panavaleka v'chuneka, Yisa Yahweh panavalecha v'yasem lecha shalom. Now may Yahweh bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his blessed countenance upon you and give you shalom. Nothing broken, nothing missing, nothing out of place. May he do so in the name of our Sar Shalom, Yeshua Messiah. Amen. 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 That was good. Shabbat Shalom. Amen. Shabbat Shalom, y'all. We're so glad y'all came. Y'all, thanks for joining us. We appreciate you. We wish you were here.